know, we only have this one life as far as we know, you know, and we only have this moment, we only have today, you know, and so if we're suffering day after day, then something has to change or we're going to continue to suffer. We are thrilled to interview Dr. Pooja Amy Shaw, a doctor in integrative medicine and family medicine. In her integrative medicine practice, she combines Eastern practices along with Western medicine to treat the mind and body holistically. In a society where we typically receive care and piecemeal, Dr. Amy Shaw believes in catering treatment to the individual and all aspects of health and wellness. Dr. Amy Shaw is an assistant professor at Columbia University, licensed in medical acupuncture, yoga teacher certified, and teaches at OPEN.com, The Path, and Nalanta Institute. We're so excited to welcome Dr. Pooja Amy Shaw. So welcome, Dr. Pooja Shah. We're so thrilled to have you here to talk to us about integrative functional medicine. And I was thinking about this because we haven't had anybody on who's an expert in the mind-body connection in the way that you are uh, in the context of medicine. Um, so we have a lot to learn from you. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So I guess to start us off, what is integrative functional medicine and how does it differ from kind of traditional primary care, traditional medicine that we're, that we're used to? Yeah, so it's great that you're asking. Um, I like to really differentiate integrative medicine and functional medicine. You know, it's complicated. There's a lot out there that is confusing. I call myself an integrative medicine first and foremost, and then I use functional medicine as part of my integrative medicine practice. So I think of it that way. And I see integrative medicine as a an amalgam of using Western medical science um, and integrating that seamlessly with other healing modalities, um, ancient Eastern, you know, modalities of healing, um, nature-centered therapies, prevention, promotion of healthy habits and well-being, and how it differs from primary care is that Western medicine is really excellent at treating acute illnesses and physical trauma, right? So you can go to the emergency room and get treated very quickly. You can get go into surgery and get a bone set. You can go in and have an infection fixed with antibiotics. But really the more chronic conditions that we're exploring in life, um, not exploring, we're, uh, we're having happen in life for a lot of people now, just due to lifestyle and a lot of other factors, um, as well as unexplained symptoms and uh, more chronic conditions. Those are much more difficult to treat and the primary care world is not so equipped to take care of that. Kind of like that whole idea of a pill for every ill, like that's not how a lot of health works. Yeah. So can you tell us about some of the Eastern practices that you've integrated to treat chronic illness and, and sort of what you've noticed in terms of improvements or success, like how you see it, how you see it working? Sure. So. So from the Eastern perspective, you know, I'm, I'm a trained yoga teacher and I've been studying meditation and mindfulness for a very long time, as well as breath work practices through the pranayama tradition, but also like vivation and Stan Groff's work and all sorts of things. And, and of course, some of that is not Eastern technically, but has um, offshoots of Eastern medicine, um, like Wim Hof pulling from the Tibetan tradition, that sort of thing. So I see our humanity as um, we are meaning making machines with perception and awareness. And the way that we see the world is through a specific lens. And that lens can be mo you know, m modulated in one way or another through these practices in order to bring us back into a present moment awareness so that we can then make better choices and be less reactive and take better care of ourselves, each other, the community, the earth, right? So it's like that. Maybe to backtrack, how did you decide even to start incorporating some of these Eastern practices into your work as a physician? Because you're trained in Western medicine. And I'm curious what inspired you to then also incorporate these Eastern practices? So it's a great question. Um, you know, I... I've always been interested in integrative medicine and had my own meditation and yoga practices and saw what good that could do. I have a long history of chronic anxiety and I've always been trying to figure out how to manage and, and unwind that. 
So it's very personal as well as for my patients. Um, I've been at Columbia University as a, as a faculty there for 12 years now. And in my first, um, my first five years when I was full-time primary care, as well as working in the hospital approximately six months of the year, um, I would see a lot of patients who are suffering from chronic pain in particular. And that was one of the biggest avenues from which I decided to start looking at other practices and training in them. What I realized is that, you know, with the chronic opioid crisis and with um, the me medications that we have available, um, treating all of this was really, really difficult and um, was not very effective. And so I decided initially to just, um, I, I was thinking about, do I do a fellowship in integrative medicine? Do I, like, what do I study to really help my patients? And I decided upon studying acupuncture because that was something I could do to a patient, right? Rather than have them have to practice at home. I was working with patients who are um, socioeconomically um, depressed or, you know, underserved. And so um, I was thinking about how I could affect change most quickly. And so that was the way it all started. So I studied acupuncture at um, four physicians at the Harvard program when it was still available and then did advanced courses and then TA'd there. And so really got into that. And that was affecting the body and which then would affect the mind and help to manage pain and not just pain, but also like how we exist in our bodies and how we are aware of how our bodies are feeling. And this is how we can start the process of, of healing that in particular pain. I'm also really appreciating that the way that you work is actually integrating these practices and administering it yourself. Because I think oftentimes when we visit doctors Western or Eastern, it's like we get a lot of referrals. And so it becomes this kind of cobbled together treatment, um, which you know can work, but oftentimes it feels disjuncted or uncoordinated. So, I mean, I, I wonder if that's something that you if that's common, if you felt like that was an important piece of this rather than kind of referring people out and kind of coming back to you. I mean, that is a really well, well, well said problem with Western medicine right now. An issue, right, is that we have created a reductionist view of health. And so we take parts apart, right? We have, we go to the pulmonologist, we go to the hematologist, we go to the rheumatologist, et cetera. And what we learn through integrative medicine and also functional medicine, right, is that this is about whole healing. It's about holistic views of the body and mind and spirit so that we are really looking at all the factors that feed into complex medical issues rather than just looking at a singular organ and then doing a bunch of tests and imaging and saying, well, you're fine, but the patient's not fine, right? And so this is often what happens. Also, we will go to specialists and get a bunch of tests done and find random things that are not quite right, which will lead us down a rabbit hole of not only anxiety and stress, but also cost, time, effort, and potential misdiagnosis or um, just what we call red herrings, right? Like, so diagnoses that maybe aren't, they're not actually the case, right? And so, so from that angle, you know, I think integrative medicine is most amazing. In fact, I just had a friend who's dealing with a whole bunch of medical issues. And she was like, well, I'm going to go to the gastro and the room and the this and that. And I was like, you need an integrative doctor. And she wrote me back. She was like, yes, I do. <laughs> and so, can you, you know, be it? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, and I realized that, unfortunately, with um, integrative and functional medicine, it's not well covered by the insurance system right now. And so it's not accessible to a lot of people. And I think that is something I'm really considering how to bridge that gap and how to make it more accessible to people. Um, because I, I realize it's just not sustainable for a lot of humans on this planet. So Now, do you work as part of a clinic or are you a, a kind of private practice practitioner? H how, how do you practice? Yeah, so I have a private uh, office. Um, from which I see my own patients. And then I'm also still faculty at Columbia. I run an integrative medicine training program that I started there in 2014, and also uh, see patients with chronic pain and musculoskeletal disorders and teach within that realm to residents and med students. So I'm there now, um, not that much, probably one and a half days a week. And then the rest is my private practice. Something that's also really struck me about the way that you work is how seriously you take patients. So not, you know, a lot of the time a patient will 
come in and list some symptoms and then they get a diagnosis or they don't get a diagnosis or they get some sort of recommendation, but you delve a little bit deeper into what's what's going on you do like a full you know full history you spend a lot of time with your patients and actually uh, one thing that you know this is more of a a personal story and i won't name her name but you diagnosed one of my friends or you you made a recommendation that one of my friends go go get an x-ray because she was having symptoms around her breast area but she was also breastfeeding at the time and a lot of doctors didn't take her seriously they were like oh this pain could be related to breastfeeding or i don't know what other reasons she got but you were like no this this could be something else even though you are breastfeeding and she she was ultimately diagnosed with cancer and died um and who knows i mean who knows what could have happened if she'd been diagnosed sooner but certainly there was a lot of time and effort that went into seeing doctors that really didn't take her very seriously and didn't do you know like a full history and really sit with her yeah i remember that very very well of course and um we're such complex beings you know and disease and chronic issues and symptoms means something's not right. And whether it's coming from the body or it is perception, it's still an imbalance of something, of some kind, right? And so we have to very much start to, to piece apart, you know, what, what is going on? And is this more of a, a mental health thing? Is this more of a truly a, a physical issue? And that's why we do labs and imaging and whatnot and physical exams and all of that stuff. And usually it's not just one or the other, but a combination of both, especially in this world, right? Where we're chronically stressed. Um, everybody, it, you know, we, we're a post-COVID world um, or continued COVID, but, you know, post-pandemic world, I should say. And, um, you know, we're on the brink of climate crisis and, you know, there's just a lot going on politically, socially, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, everybody's under so much stress and, so that affects us really greatly. And I think the generation we're in, the generations in front of us, you know, it, there, there's a new way of being and also with technology being what it is and AI and et cetera, et cetera. So there's, it's very complex right now. So navigating that and then also navigating your body and being in touch with that um, is a challenge. And so, so much of my work is about teaching people how to become more embodied so that they can really feel themselves but also know what's going on in their mind and really start to under, you know, starting to understand that these two things interface constantly. And if we can start to pay attention more, but without, you know, being hypervigilant, then we can start to understand how our rhythms work, who we are, what's happening. You know, something that this might be anecdotal and I don't know what the research says, but I, I just sort of recognized in my patients this sort of rise in, in, in autoimmune issues or gastrointestinal issues. And, and that seems to me like such a kind of connection between mind and body, or they just seem like there's such an overlap when it comes to that. And I'm wondering if, I mean, if, if that's something that you see more in your practice and, and if so, kind of the way that you address, maybe even assess and, and how you think about different kinds of autoimmune disorders? And you let me know if that's too broad of a question, but I, I'd be curious how, how you've been thinking about it. I mean, it, you're absolutely right. Um, autoimmune disorders are rising as well as gut, gut issues. My experience shows me that the cause of this are many fold, right? So there's a lot of environmental things going on, toxins in our food, um, really bad food, <laughs> you know, in terms of like farming methods, glycophosphates, et cetera, et cetera. And then we are talking about this chronic stress stuff that's going on. There's a lot of other environmental toxins. And I think that in many ways, along with technology, dysfunctional biorhythms, right? From, from staying up too late, blue light, all of these things are piecing together and creating hormonal dysfunction, inflammation, dysregulation, which then can lead to a lot of downstream effects. Autoimmunity, we, we are learning, right? Like if you look at the work of Gabor Mate, people like that, you're really seeing there's like a very deep mind-body connection. And I've thought this always. And so parsing those things apart is challenging. Um, lots of people with thyroid dysfunction, uh, like undifferentiated rheumatologic dysfunction, stuff like that. 
they're, they're coming in droves <laughs> and we're trying to uh, work with that. You know, what I'm learning though is that with rheumatologic processes in particular, um, I mean, it usually comes back to the basics, right? So nutrition, movement, um, sleep, of course, and com community connection, meaning and purpose, downtime, stress management and regulation, all of these things matter. And of course, if we can, it's, it's hard to do all of those in a very stressful life, but we start small and we build, you know, and that's how a lot of my patients get better just from that. Cause they'll go to the rheumatologist and be offered medications, but like most of them don't want to take it, especially if they're not suffering too badly and maybe their numbers aren't so off, or maybe it's an unexplained rheumatologic process. And then from the, like the gut side, it's, you know, a lot to do with hormone dysfunction, thyroid dysfunction, food allergies, um, and, and sensitivities. Gluten is a big problem for a lot of people. I don't malign gluten. I don't think it's evil, but I also think what's happened in this country with food and the hyper-processing of uh, flour and, and brains in particular has been a big issue. And for people who do have certain rheumatologic, rheumatologic issues, it can be really detrimental. So, um, you know, I try not to malign anything, but I also really think about who and what, you know, and why <laughs> for each patient. But so gut dysfunction, you know, also crosses, of course, the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and um, how our sympathetic nervous system works and the vagus nerve connection and all of that. So there's a deep gut brain connection that also adds to the, you know, adds fuel to the fire of gut dysfunction. So figuring that stuff out too, um, I have a, my own methodology for that, but there are ways to treat it too and people get better. So it's, it's just a matter of, you know, I, I again, think about it as like imbalance rather than disease. And so why, how did we get so far off track and how do we bring you back on track? And then how do we teach you how to take care of yourself so you don't need me anymore because that's always right like you want to have patients that can take care of themselves and then not have patients right so somebody else will show up can you talk to us about stress because that's something i mean simone and i certainly see a lot of patients that come in feeling pretty stressed pretty anxious overworked burned out um, and i wonder if you can talk to us a little bit about what is good stress what is a you know an appropriate level of stress and and when it tips over into being toxic stress how do you know when you've you've crossed the threshold into something that's looking more like toxic stress yeah it's a great question so stress is fascinating and i'm sure you've heard about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system right so there's two parts to the nervous system two big parts and one is called the fight or flight response. That's the sympathetic side. And then there's the rest and digest, the more parasympathetic side, which is um, quite modulated by the vagus nerve. And that stress response happens with that fight or flight stuff, right? And so good stress is a cab is coming at you and you jump out of the way, right? And so that type of stress is really good. So are things like challenging yourself, doing a talk for a public audience, right? Like going to um, a new country and traveling and trying new things, taking a course, learning new skills. These are all positive stressors because they stress the body and the system. And then you're able to come back to baseline quickly, but you've now kind of pushed your edges or your boundaries. And so uh, there was a you know, a famous author and researcher, Han, um, Hans Selye, back in like the 30s to 70s. And he wrote about... Um, use stress, meaning this is that good stress, right? And so then there's the, the bad stress or distress. That's what he would call it. And so toxic stress or chronic stress is when things get bad. And so this is when you, maybe your boss yells at you and you're stressed out, like that stinks. And maybe you're worried about losing your job. But then what happens is you continue to think about that and perseverate and ruminate. And perhaps that starts to, you know, feed into lots of other things about the story and narrative you're con connecting to that. And then also your, you know, kid is sick and you, your partner's late and the fridge is empty and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, all these little stressors start to pile on and your body becomes in that chronic state of fight or flight. And then that becomes a very big issue because that is going to lead to downstream effects of hormone dysregulation, gut stuff like we talked about, potentially further down the line, rheumatologic processes or other inflammatory issues um, or 
you know, metabolic issues like elevated blood sugar, cardiovascular disease, stuff like that. So toxic stress is that chronic stress that doesn't have an end. It just kind of keeps going and then it keeps piling and you haven't found ways to, to kind of work with it and to really figure out a life that is going to be less, less stressful, you know? It's, it's tough. And also practices, of course, and this is where the Eastern practices really come in and not just Eastern, but lots of practices that can really help to modulate day-to-day stressors so that your nervous system has time to re kind of reset or um, just rebalance. So how do you help like a neurotic New Yorker who comes into your office, who's super stressed, high pressure? Um, you know, what do you tell them? Right. So that's all of my patients, right? Because we're in New York. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I used to be one myself. Um, so no shame. You know, one, I've cultivated an intake um, for my patients, for new patients um, that has, you know, taken a long time to curate. But one of the biggest questions, you know, one of the questions on there asks about stress and where do you feel it in your body? And also what stresses you out and what what lends life for fun, you know, when do you have fun? How do you feel better? And also what gives you meaning and purpose? And so I think starting from maybe that lens is always useful because it starts to prioritize how is it that I wanna feel in my life? Where do I wanna be? What's not working? Starting from those angles really is useful. I will teach patients different techniques to start to modulate their stress in the moment um, right now, the flavor of the last maybe three months for me has been breath work because I'm, I'm like obsessed with it right now. You know, things like meditation and mindfulness practice, those things take years to really develop and they are amazing, but you, you really have to practice them. And with using your breath as a module, you know, modulating your physiology, it's, it's much quicker. So I would say, you know, the, that's the long answer. So the short answer is really understanding, you know, what what is the person about? What do they want? What can change at work or not change, right? So what are we working with? I have a lot of patients who end up changing jobs or life, you know, lifestyle in one way or another once they really start on the healing path because they realize what they're doing is not sustainable. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, toxic capitalism and all the stuff we don't need to get into. But as someone who burned out personally in 2014 at my, you know, at Columbia, um, very textbook case, you know, I had to make a lot of changes too. And that's why you see me doing two different practices now. So you have to, you have to shift and change as, as you go. And then you use the practices as a method of, of taking care of yourself day to day, moment by moment, especially if you really see yourself falling into, you know, a pit of some kind (laughs) to really help to keep you out of falling deeply into that. Hi, Lovelink listeners. We want to let you know that we've started a group practice in New York City called Modern Mind, with offices in the West Village and Williamsburg. We offer individual and couples therapy and are currently accepting clients for virtual and in-person sessions. If you're experiencing a sense of stuckness in your life or relationship, we're here to help. Please visit modernmind.co to learn more about our practice. That's modernmind.co. Sounds like you also do a lot of psychotherapeutic work, kind of really understanding people's barriers and really being intentional about what helps them relax. You know, something that I've really recognized about a lot of very busy, high stress New Yorkers is that what they do to relax, and I put that in quotes, is something that can oftentimes be really passive and not very nourishing, like looking at their phone or watching TV, and that actually it doesn't release the stress and pressure. And I feel like that alone is a real problem in our culture and our society and our world. And so, yeah, to just really kind of take a moment and consider how our practices impact ourselves, I feel like is, is really huge. It sounds like you would do that even in, in the early stages of evaluation. Oh, yeah. I, try, I mean, I give my patients a practice at their first visit. You know, that's part of the, the ethos of my practice. And I would argue that things like looking at your phone or watching TV aren't practices at all, right? They're, they're a method of numbing 
the discomfort or dis-ease that's occurring in the mind and body. So it's one thing to get a dopamine hit, right? And to be able to like look at your phone or to, to drink some alcohol, eat something sugary, you name it, right? Like game online, watch porn, shop, like you name it. it there's so many ways to numb out. And what I'm trying to do with my patients at least and, and my students and my residents and hopefully, you know, your, your audience is to, to recognize that there are ways to, uh, or there, there are practices that can actually bring you back to yourself and back, back to the present moment and give you a sense of inner calmness or peace or just a sense of okayness, right? When everything feels out of control and really hard and stressful. And so I try to differentiate really clearly those things that we're using to get the dopamine hit to numb out versus the things that are really nourishing for the whole person. Yes, yes. Yeah. And how, how do you work with nutrition? Like how do you recommend diets or how people eat? What's your process around that? You know, I think the Western world has really complicated nutrition and it's, it's unfortunate, right? There's just so many fads and, and like information, misinformation on and on. I, I tend to keep a much more um, holistic, I mean, obviously holistic, but I, I don't know, like a, a much more grounded view of nutrition. I, I kind of look to the blue zones. I don't know if you, do you know the blue zones? These are um, I believe seven countries in the world that have the most amount of centurions, like the oldest living people. And so there was, there were studies done on what are the commonalities between these people. And there's, you know, Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, like there's one in Costa Rica, Nicoya Peninsula, Loma Linda, California, and there's others in Greece and whatnot. And so some of the commonality of their diet is that, they eat whole grains, they limit dairy, they eat very limited amounts of meat, if at all. They um, eat together, <laughs> they eat tons of plants, you know, they have a varying number of, of nuts and seeds and this and that in their diet. So, you know, I, I tend to recommend the eat more plants diet, <laughs> which is like whole foods, less processed anything, lower no sugar, and, um, and, and just like as much like home cooking as possible. And if you can't do that, then healthy prepared foods. And so, uh, that's, that's how I look at nutrition because what we do know about plants is that they have fiber, they have bioflavonoids, antioxidants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they are like the primo food out of all of the categories in terms of just nutrient density and also for prevention. And so if we can make plants are the majority of our diet and then do the other stuff in the way that your body can handle it, right? Some people can't handle dairy. Some people can't handle gluten, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so and some people don't eat meat or, you know, there, there's a, that's a whole other conversation just about our practices in this country and fishing practices and ocean health and whatnot. But so if we look at it from that big picture, you know, plants are probably the safest and they have, you know, if you can get organic, they have the lowest amount of pesticides and other things. Of course, we've depleted our soils from monocropping and from you know, these big factory farms, but you do your best and you try to shop local, go to your farmer's market, et cetera, for these reasons, right? The soil's better nourished, et cetera. Hopefully, you know, you're getting nutrient dense foods for most of your meals. And that is the way to really start the gut health stuff, right? To start whole health, to start with prevention of not just cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, but also cancers and things like that. And so, yeah, that's how I look at it. <laughs> I'm curious to hear more about your experience of moving out of burnout and what were some of the practices that helped you to do that? Um, and also what are some of the daily practices or general practices that you would recommend to people, but it sounds like you have, you know, a lot of personal experience with these practices and, and have found them very useful yourself. So I was curious to hear about your personal experience to start. Thanks for asking. Um, so one thing I like to, I don't like to tell patients to do anything I haven't tried myself because I just don't think that's fair. Right. Um, so with burnout, oh my goodness, that's a tough one, right? You really, you really like fall to the bottom of the, 
of the barrel and it, it looks very dark. And um, what I noticed in myself was I, I lost that, you know, I'm, I consider myself a very empathetic and compassionate human. And that empathy and compassion was really starting to shift in me. And I noticed that and I realized then that something's not right with me, you know, that this is happening. And so when all of that happened, it was a long time ago now, maybe, you know, almost 10 years ago, I decided to leave my full-time faculty position. And so um, I did that and I started to work in an urgent care just to make ends meet. And um, I started studying yoga very regularly. That was a very big change for me. And then I also started studying contemplative psychotherapy. And so uh, that was a Buddhist-based um, curriculum that weaves um, Buddhist philosophy with with psychotherapy. And that was a two-year program. And so um, those were the two biggest components of crawling out of burnout. And then I started my own practice and having that wind of that energy of being able to do what I want to do instead of um, having to fight the medical system and or just follow their lead, which I felt uh, was really not nourishing for me, um, was, was how I got out of it. And so how do you use that to help people who are experiencing burnout? Because I imagine you can really relate to people, and I know there's so many in New York who feel like they're working a job and they're just so depleted. They kind of feel like they're part of this grind. Yeah, how do you, how do you use your experience to inform how you help them? So if they, if they can't leave their job, and most people aren't ready to just leave their job, right? Like, that's hard. Um, so we start small, and we make micro changes or small changes into the day-to-day that they're doing. So whether that's investigating their nutritional status and maybe doing an elimination diet because they're also feeling like something's not right with their food or, you know, I always get labs on patients who will correct any, you know, issue that's going on, of course, um, metabolically or in the vitamin realm, hormonally, et cetera. Um, so we'll work on that too. So those will start to help the patient feel different. And I'll often put them on supplements or herbals or things that will help to shift the energy a little bit, um, from what they're dealing with, whether it's more depressive symptoms or anxiety or sleep issues or, you know, fatigue, brain fog, all of those things. And then we start to really evaluate like what is happening in life. So it comes back to that comment I made about meaning and purpose and really, um, and, and what, what really lights you up, you know, it's a common factor I found in all of like almost all of my patients is that, you know, that I have a question, what do you, what do you long to do if money or time wasn't an issue? And like everybody says, help others. And it's so fascinating, right? Because everybody wants to just help each other. And it's it's so beautiful. And it's sad that we're not getting that out of our work in, in this world. And so often the people, um, the patients that I work with that are really dealing with burnout, we try to start to reconnect with how can we not just help ourselves, but help those around us, whether that's just not just, but in our family unit, or is that in our friend circle? Is that in our community? Is that at our job? Something to start to interconnect. Because as we know, belonging is like the craving of human life, right? Like being in connection, whether we admit it or not. Um, So, and of course there's outliers for anything, but um, the general, I would say that's a general truth about humans. So reconnecting to yourself, right? Because burnout is about losing yourself in some way. And so we're bringing it back to the to the person that's right in front of you. And I mean, just from my work as a therapist, I find that when patients make the start to make those small changes and notice the positive effects, they really don't want to go back to this earlier version, you know, you'll do anything to hold on to that, that um, positive experience and coming home to yourself. And so it, does, it doesn't surprise me that a lot of your patients have made big life changes as a consequence of experiencing that positive feeling um, that comes along with making, making you know, some of those small changes initially. Yeah, it's, you know, we only have this one life as far as we know, you know, and we only have this moment, we only have today, you know, and so for suffering day after day, then something has to change or we're going to continue to suffer. And not everybody is ready to change, right? And that's another question on the intake is how ready are you to change? And some people will want to keep working on things and aren't ready to change. And that's okay too, because one day they will be. 
other people are very much ready to change and those that are, you know, there's like a commitment that shows up and then, and then those changes that you're talking about, Sine, are like, right, like they're happening. And then it just, it's like a flywheel. It's just like the momentum starts and everything starts to shift. Um, but it's also practices are hard, right? I always tell my patients this, if, if it were easy just to keep up with practices, we'd all be doing great, you know, <laughs> like, but it's, it's not easy to keep up with the meditation practice and then the writing and then, you know, like going to bed on the, at, at the right time every day and, and being able to get that high quality sleep. And, and so it, it's not easy, but it's, um, so vital to, in order to live kind of this, um, rich and, and nourished and, and, and bright life that it has just a feeling of vitality and flow and, and love and kindness and care and all of those things. And I think when you can help patients connect more to themselves, the practices I think become easier. I mean, it's a bi-directional thing. Sometimes with the practices you can connect more, but that, that, that having that respect for your body, having that kind of connection with yourself just allows things to kind of happen with more intention, more integrity, more alignment with your values. Like that seems like such a core piece. I think you're exactly right. And how do you set expectations around how long it takes to make these changes and to build new habits and to stick with practices? Because it does take a long time to really embody those practices, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, I I don't have a a system or a protocol for that. I do give my patients a, a healing and wellness timeline. So there's everything we do for that visit is, you know, the plan is all in front of them. And so we can track like that. And if it feel, if it's very novel and, or it's a new thing, totally, we'll try something super simple, right? Like five days out of the week, you do five minutes, something to that effect, or maybe it's even three days, something that's very approachable. I will often use the smart goal kind of basis, you know, to like, to, to help to, keep some sort of boundary around the new practice, but we don't always do that. And, and then we just revisit it, right? What, what went well, what didn't, what were the barriers? You know, when you did do it, did you feel different? Did it not connect to you? And I think that's something that's so important is that there are a zillion practices out there, you know, and variations of some basic stuff, you know, like there's, but it's got to resonate with you for you to keep up with it, right? Like if it's, it feels like, getting your tooth pulled, like that's not going to work. And so, you know, I have some patients that like hate the idea of meditation. So we're not going to do that. I'm not going to be like, so go meditate, right? Like that doesn't work. And so we figure out something else, you know, maybe we use the breath or we use tapping or we use movement or we use, you know, all sorts of other things that will help to create the same type of space. And, and this is to downregulate the nervous system. Now, if you want to start getting advanced and really work on your mind and work on awareness and you know, all of those things, then, then I would say having a teacher and having a very formal practice and all of that is really makes sense. What I'm talking about is using the practices right now to downregulate the nervous system. And so, um, you know, you got to meet the patient where they are and then it comes much more naturally because they start to feel different. Right. And then that's huge because that's the, that's the buy-in. You mentioned supplements earlier, and I'm wondering what are the supplements you recommend and, um, yeah, if that varies from person to person, or if you just have also your like go-tos that you think everyone should be on. So yeah, I, I, I'm very um, careful about talking about supplements just because it is so specific to every pa- you know, every patient is so different and complex and they have the things going on. So it's hard to have like an umbrella of this is what you should take. Um, so I, I, that's the caveat here, right? Like I, I'm very wary to recommend specific things. Um, I mean, I can give you a couple things that I often recommend. Um, one is magnesium. Um, you need to make sure you get the right type, right? Depending on your GI system and whatnot. But uh, magnesium is, you know, a mineral that helps regulate a bunch of other minerals in your body, like calcium, potassium, sodium. And it's also essential for cellular health. And it's a critical component for like a bunch of biochemical reactions, something like 300 plus. So because of our soils being depleted, you know, there's less magnesium in our plant foods. And, and so it it, supplementing with that can be useful. It also helps with relaxing muscle tissue. So it can be good for that chronic stress and anxiety that causes a lot of, you know, tightness in the body and it may help with sleep as well. So 
that's a really nice one because it's pretty benign. It's hard to overdose on it. Um, and I'll check a magnesium level on patients and, um, you know, I sometimes find it low and sometimes it's okay. And I still may supplement with that. Another one is I like CoQ10 a lot. Um, that's a natural substance found in the body, um, that helps fight oxidative stress. It starts to be in lower levels as you age, like starting around 40. And so, you know, I may um, offer that to patients that may have some cholesterol lowering benefits and um, help with energy and heart health and brain health and slow skin aging. So it's a good one, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. Um, and I also use it for patients who have migraines for prophylaxis. Um, also curcumin is a really, I love, you know, that comes from my lineage. Um, so it's the turmeric plant, curcuma longa, and it's a really great anti-inflammatory, um, may help with depression and preventing blood clots and, you know, regulating cholesterol and helping with joint pain and arthritis. So that's a really nice anti-inflammatory. And if you do use it, you want to make sure you have the alkaloid and black pepper piperine with it because it needs to be absorbed through your gut. Otherwise it kind of hangs out in the gut. So that's another, another one. (laughs) And, um, are there any practices you recommend everybody engage with? Yeah, I think it maybe it's like some practice, right? Like the practice that works for you, it would be my answer. And so whether that is, you know, for me right now, like ever since my divorce, it's been like gratitude practice every morning and I meditate every morning and I also write and that's my thing. And then lately also it's been breath work in the evenings. And so those are my big kind of quote unquote practices that help to bookend my day, provide structure for my day. And then I think everybody needs to move their body. So that's a big one too, right? Um, That's, that's for everyone. Um, Whether that is, you know, going on walks or it's CrossFit, you know, it doesn't matter how you move your body really. I mean, there's nuance there, but just getting your energy flowing, your blood flowing, your heart pumping, right? It's so good for brain health. It's so good for mental health on and on stress regulation. So, and we just need it to be, you know, I always say you use it or you lose it, right? So you got to use your brain and you also have to use your muscles and your body. And so moving is, is enormous. And then from there, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat, but then just what you choose, stick with it and really give it a go. Like sometimes like practices, as you know, aren't easy to keep up and will fall off because it's normal and human to do, then we must just get back on. And that's the, that's the key, right? Coming back and not beating yourself up that you fell off and then just losing it. Just saying, okay, I missed a couple of days. It's all good. Let's come back. <laughs> I'm just starting over <laughs> and being really kind to yourself, self-compassion. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Cause a lot of people get critical, myself included, if I start something oh, yeah. and then I lose it and then it's like, ah, oh, I messed up, I fucked up, I can't go back. But yeah, so that self-compassion seems important. Well, just the term daily practice is also just a really nice way of saying, okay, it didn't work today, it can work tomorrow. You know, just being kind of gentle and having it really be, rather than a kind of set in stone schedule for yourself, a a practice of of trying. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a really big proponent of of like reminders for yourself, however you do it. For me, I, I have, I have a sticky note problem, right? But I'll put them on my mirror or in my kitchen and they'll just be little reminders like breathe, question mark, are you rushing? You know, like these are little things to, well, one of them is right now, where is my breath? Because I'm so good at holding my breath or keeping it contracted. And so I'll just check in and, and then take a deep breath. And those little things, those micro changes can also be so incredibly useful. And so maybe like putting something on your iPhone or you could put a reminder in your Google Cal or whatever, you know, so it's just little ways of pinging yourself to remind yourself to like, do those little things. They're huge. The little things are what add up. And so we just have to start small. And if you can just remember to keep doing them, it's, it's amazing. It'll start to change your whole life. I love that. It's a really great piece of advice. So where can people find you? if They want to contact you or see you. How can they, how can they look you up? So um, you can go to my website. It's Dr. Dr. Pooja Amy Shaw.com. And I have a lot of information there about all of the things I've talked about. 
You can also find me on Instagram at Dr. Pooja Amy Shaw. I'm also working on developing some workshops, hopefully in person, that are going to really blend learning about the body and mind, but also utilizing all of these practices so that it becomes very experiential and really fun and juicy. So that's something hopefully will come that, you know, will be coming in the fall or maybe the winter. And I'm also working on a book. So hopefully that will come out at some point. Yeah. So there's some things happening. Yeah. Well, this was so great. We learned a lot and uh, it's a good reminder for me too in speaking to you about what, I, what I'd like to come back to for myself. So thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. 